Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Nikola Mikovic, who's a freelance journalist, researcher, and analyst based in Serbia. His work focuses mostly on the foreign policies of Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. His area of focus is the ongoing conflict in the Donbass, as well as relations between Russia and former Soviet republics. Nikola also covers Russia's involvement in Syria and Libya and elsewhere. He writes for several publications, such as Diplomatic Courier, Geopolitics and Empire, Asia Times, CGTN, did I mention geopolitics and empire, global comments and others? Welcome back to GNE, Nicola. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, it's it's good to uh, have you back. I see you've been doing the rounds. You were on TNT Radio with Jesse Zerowell. Uh recently. You were, uh, you know, who's my colleague who I've uh, interviewed, and I think I've been on his program. And uh, you were with uh, Rolo Slavsky and Riley Wagaman as well, having discussions on Rolo's. Substack, and maybe to start to get your thoughts on the current state of the collective Kremlin, as uh, Yuri Roshka calls it. And uh, I, I think we could start with your tweets. I, I very much enjoy your tweets, and uh, you you recently rep- uh, tweeted out. According to reports, the span of the Crimean bridge was reportedly damaged by two explosions. Who who would have thought that could happen? And then you screenshot your own tweet from November of last year, where you said, after Ukrainian attacks on the Crimean Bridge and the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, the Kremlin decided to extend the grain deal. What comes next? Ukraine will likely wait until the Crimean Bridge is repaired, and then they will once again try to destroy it. The weak get uh, beaten. So you uh, are some sort of prophet Nikola, what are your thoughts on uh, this second attack? It, it, I don't think it was a major attack, but nonetheless, uh, what your, your thoughts here? Yeah, it wasn't a major attack, but it was quite obvious that Ukraine uh, was going to attack that bridge. Back in November, it was so obvious. And I can tell you right now that Ukraine will try to destroy that bridge again and again and again, and there will be other more important targets. And uh, the we get meet, beaten, that's exactly what... Uh, Putin said in, I think, in 2004. Um, and uh, to this day, he continues uh, implementing that policy. So Russia continues demonstrating its weakness, and Ukraine, of course, is using that. Uh, policymakers in Kiev and in the West as well, they're quite aware that the Kremlin will never seriously retaliate. Although it is rather questionable if, if Russia is the one that should retaliate, because initially it is Russia that invaded Ukraine not the other way around. So Ukrainian attack on the Crimean bridge is a form of retaliation. So everything that Ukraine is doing is basically retaliation. Um, Russia was expected to respond um, last time when Ukraine hit that bridge. That was in October, I believe, last year. Uh, and that is when Russia launched its uh, campaign. It was striking Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Um, but the goal of that operation was obviously not to destroy Ukrainian energy infrastructure, but to just to um, to convince the Ukrainian people that Russia is their enemy, so that they have another reason to hate Russia even more, because they were it, it's the civilian population that was suffering as a result of those attacks. Uh, they had blackouts. Sometimes they didn't have electricity for for twelve hours or so. But in the end, as you as you know. Ukraine simply continued exporting electricity because its energy infrastructure was not destroyed. So that was obviously never the goal. Uh, and right now, I think Russia will use the same strategy. We see that it um, it conducted uh, missile strikes on the port of Odessa, um, and the port was reportedly damaged. Although I don't think it's it was seriously damaged because I don't think Russia aims to completely destroy that port. Um, so basically, it will use the same strategy it used last time. Uh, I don't think the Kremlin's goal is to completely destroy Ukraine um, abilities to export its grains. Um, it's probably just another PR stunt that the Kremlin is constantly using. So when it comes to Putin, it's all about PR. Um, and uh, when he launched the, those missile strikes in October or November last year, um it was he openly said that it was russia's retaliation not only to what happened uh in crimea the crimea bridge but also um that was um russia's response to ukrainian um 
recapture of um, Harrison. So that's the city that Russia previously annexed, and then it simply withdrew from that city. And then it had to create an illusion that it's fighting seriously. So uh, it decided to strike the Ukrainian cities and uh, energy infrastructure. So right now, Russia will most likely use, as I said, more or less the same strategy. Although this time, I don't think they will strike you know, critical energy infrastructure, but maybe ports in Odessa or Mykolaiv or so on. Um, but in any case, um, I wouldn't hurry with conclusions. It is possible that eventually Russia will strike uh, so-called uh, decision-making centers in Ukraine. Um, but in fact, those are just uh, empty administrative buildings because the Kremlin will definitely make sure that no one gets killed because Putin promised to his Israeli friends that Zelensky will not be killed. Um, they are constantly trying to convince their audience, Russian audience, that Ukrainian top military officials, uh, Zeluzhny and Budano, were killed, <laughs> although they're safe and well, they're alive, but for the Russian audience, they are dead. Um, so yeah, there will be some symbolic strikes as a form of retaliation, and Ukraine, on the other hand, will simply continue uh, attacking not only the Crimean Bridge, but other more important uh, facilities and um, Ukraine, unlike Russia, is uh, willing to fight until victory. Now the question is if the West will allow Ukraine to, to win this war. So that's another topic that we can discuss later. Riots across Europe, unprecedented food and energy inflation, increasing military conflict around the globe, and a rising digital police state. The fourth turning is here. And so is the Expat Money Summit, the free online event expatmoneysummit.com is back and will help you navigate these turbulent times. Featuring dozens of renowned experts such as Dr. Ron Paul, international man Doug Casey, Jim Rogers, and Mark Faber, the summit will reveal how you can reclaim your freedom abroad, reduce your tax bill, protect your wealth, obtain multiple citizenships and residencies, become part of a like-minded global community, and more. Founder of expatmoney.com, Mikhail Thorup, will be your guide on this journey to protect yourself from economic collapse, World War III, authoritarian Western regimes, and Klaus Schwab's Great Reset. Simply go to expatmoneysummit.com and enter your email to reserve a free ticket to the event. Do it now. And then another hot tweet uh, of yours, because I'm curious about uh, a number of things uh, here, your thoughts on Russia not renewing uh, the grain deal, uh, what's going on with Turkey? You, you tweet, the Kremlin has finally responded to Turkey's construction of a factory in Ukraine that will produce a Bayraktar drones. Russia has sent two am amphibious aircraft to Turkey to help the country extinguish uh, wildfires. So maybe first, uh, your thoughts on Russia deciding not to extend uh, the grain deal and then Turkey, which seems to, to, to continue to act against its uh, ally, uh, Russia. Well, back in May, I believe, Russia announced that it does not plan to extend the grain deal. It, take, it took about a year almost for Russia to realize that, uh, it, that its Western partners did not implement the deal, apparently. Um, so Russia eventually decided to suspend its participation in the Black Sea Initiative, also known as the Grain Deal. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that Russia will uh, really um, try to prevent Ukraine from exporting its grains. As I said, it, it, it will almost certainly continue striking those ports, but Ukraine has other ways of exporting its grains. Um, Kiev already announced that it can do that through uh, Bulgarian and Romanian ports. And I don't think Russia will dare to hit Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian grain. Um, so that's it, it's, it's a very difficult situation for the Kremlin, because if Ukraine and Turkey continue implementing the grain deal without Russia's participation, then the Kremlin will be in a big problem because um, it will be it will become quite obvious that Russia is just not in a position to do anything to prevent that. Uh, so I think that was one of the reasons why Russia decided to uh, extend that deal in the past. And last time when Russia extended it was in May, just days before Turkish uh, so-called historic elections. So Putin helped his friend Erdogan 
back then. Um, I'm not saying that indirect support was crucial, but anyway, Erdogan used it to portray himself as a great diplomat um, because Putin made another concession to him and he extended the grain deal. And Turkey is, uh, it, it was benefiting from, from that deal, uh, both politically and economically. Um, and now that, that story is apparently over for now, at least. Uh, although I think in the future, maybe in the near future, next month or so, if Putin and Erdogan meet in, uh, Turkey, if Putin dares to, to travel there to meet with his friend, which is how he calls Erdogan, uh, then the two leaders could sign a new deal, new grain deal between Turkey and Russia. So Turkey has an option basically to, uh, continue purchasing Ukrainian grains, um, uh, be directly from Ukraine, which could be risky since the Kremlin refuses to provide security guarantees now or through ports of Bulgaria and Romania, or Turkey can simply purchase uh, Russian grains. Um, but in that case, I'm sure Russia will have to provide a significant discount to its Turkish partners. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why Russia um, simply turned a blind eye to Turkey's decision to build up drone factory in Ukraine, which sounds really amazing. I mean, the war is going on in Ukraine and Ukraine is building, actually Turkey is building that uh, plant in in Ukraine. So how how come, how, how is that even possible? How does Turkey know that Russia is not going to strike that facility? So obviously it, it got some guarantees from the Kremlin that Russia will not dare to strike that uh, Turkish owned plant. Which makes sense because if Russia does not dare to to strike empty administrative buildings in Kiev, why would it strike Turkish properties in in Ukraine? Um, so yeah, if maybe they made that some kind of a deal, for instance, so we will purchase your grain, but you don't don't touch our plant in Ukraine, something like that. I mean, I'm just uh, speculating. I don't know that, but I'm pretty sure that that there is a deal between Russia and Turkey, and there will be more deals in the future. Um, whether Putin decides to travel to Turkey or not, they could they could always hold an online summit uh, and to to make some you new know, separate grain deals. I mean, what what you just mentioned uh, takes me back to my recent interview with uh, former Moldovan politician Yuri Oroshka, who said in 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 some ways there there's a war going on, but it's not between nation states; it's between private entities, and we're not even sure who they are. These uh, private uh, financial powers, oligarchies corporations behind the scenes and kind of like what you just mentioned uh you know if supposedly if russia's at war with ukraine and turkey's an ally of russia but they're building you know this 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 business this this corporation this uh, drone uh factory in uh ukraine but it's got a guarantee that the russian state won't won't hit it so it's, it's more like what's more important are these uh corporations and businesses than the actual nation the the the, the states it's like the states are actually uh a shell uh, and what's really going on is more of a war of uh co corporations and their agendas but you know we can get into that a bit later and uh you know I, just after the 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 bridge uh event I, we we saw as you know you just mentioned the grain deal was not extended there was also reported that uh Putin temporarily froze uh some western assets in Russia uh namely you know foodstuffs corporations like Dan and yogurt and and Carlsberg so it seemed like you know in one sense it seemed like the 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 Kremlin was maybe going to put its foot down you know finally now because they're getting attacked but no not really like do you feel they're just doing more of the same posturing or will the Kremlin uh is the Kremlin beginning to uh react uh properly you know and in, in as an actor in this war well, from the Kremlin's perspective, it is reacting properly because it is protecting the interests of Russian oligarchs who are playing the major role in Russia, who basically pulled the strings in the Kremlin. Uh, and there are also, you mentioned corporations. Yeah, there are also significant Russian energy corporations that are very influential here. Um, for instance, Gazprom. To this day, it continues exporting uh, gas to Europe through Ukraine's territory. Uh, even though the war there goes on and it is paying fees to Ukraine. And there is nothing strange about that because I've been claiming for years that, that the energy corporations and their interests 
are a major driver of Russia's foreign policy. Um, it's quite possible that in the West, um, corporations uh, are very powerful and that they uh, play a major role there, but I'm I'm focusing on Russia mostly. So, um, yeah, um, it, the, the Kremlin is trying not to completely um, break ties with its Western partners. It is trying to um, preserve status quo, even though it is the West that is uh, trying to um, distance itself from Russia and to isolate Russia, which it did to a significant extent. Although, yeah, there are still corporations that continue doing business in Russia directly or indirectly or there are even even here in in serbia there are there are russian companies that are that open their um offices here so they can continue doing business with um with the west it's not a secret um so the war is businesses you know and uh, business is good uh and um that will go on i don't i don't think russia as long as those oligarchs and energy corporations are pulling the strings and the kremlin will change its approach regarding this war in ukraine maybe to get uh by the way for the multipolaristas out there uh make you happy i got my putin mug uh coffee mug right here i i picked it up in saint petersburg six seven years ago uh, when I was, uh, when I met with Mikhail Gorbachev and, and, uh, others, but, uh, you know, back to Prigozhin, the whole Prigozhin affair, I recently had on Lee Slusher, sl shout out to him, uh, security expert who spent 25 plus years, um, supporting the U.S. intelligence community and, and, and special ops and his view um i think he uses the russian word mas mas maskirovka uh, kind of like theater maybe the whole prigozhin thing so it used to be theater because he makes a point where if you really go against the collective kremlin you're gonna be you know falling off a bridge falling out a window uh or going to jail like uh some Khodorovsky. and the fact that wagner um prigozhin nothing happened to him he's walking for he was he was in saint petersburg he was in moscow he's in belarus all you know it's all no, nothing's happened to him uh and then there, there was no really no there was no coup, coup you know there was this kind of faux march to 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 moscow um and so it, it it seems to have shaken up a bit maybe some of the leadership uh and the russian military and political establishment but uh it, i i'm viewing it more as either some sort of russian false flag uh operation or some uh inept uh operation that, that, that they're just kind of managing now to s sweep under the rug uh or or, or something um so what, you know, what are your thoughts in the aftermath of uh the prigozhin uh mutiny yeah well we still don't know what he what exactly he wanted to achieve if his goal was to uh, force put into fire shoigu and garasimov then he obviously failed um it's clear that he was not ready to fight until victory or to go all the way um because he, he, I, I believe that he had an opportunity to capture the kremlin because the, the ross guardia was definitely not willing to fight against the wagner groups um and according to reports reports several russian officials fled and some of them went to saint petersburg some of them, some of them went even to neighboring countries um and pro-kremlin propagandists were quiet that day uh, they were nowhere to be seen because i think they were just waiting to see what would be the outcome of that um rebellion and then many of them were i think just willing to join the winner wherever that is uh, which is what they did eventually they joined um, the putin and collective kremlin as you say or maybe the collective putin um so we don't know what was the goal of uh, precautions operation um the fact that he can continue uh, freely operating in, in, in Russia and also in Belarus suggests that the Kremlin is extremely weak and that there is nothing Russia can do to punish him for uh, trying to create a chaos, if that's what he wanted to do. I mean, he was accused of being a traitor, but he is still free as if nothing happened. Um, basically until june 23 he was portrayed in russian media as a hero and then on june 24 he suddenly became a bad guy a, uh, a criminal they realized that in the past he, he spent some time in jail and uh 
they just started demonizing him, which is very interesting. They were not aware of that apparently until uh, June 24. Yeah. Um, now, according to reports, Prigozhin is in Belarus. But again, we don't know what exactly Wagner troops are doing there. Are they just trying to, to train Belarusian troops or are, are they preparing for something? I don't think they plan to capture Kiev as some Western Ukrainian atmosphere. I don't think they have capacity to do that under current circumstances, because even if they manage to, to get like 20,000, 25,000 troops there, it's definitely not enough to, to capture Kiev. Uh, maybe in the future, if they get the green light, maybe they will try some local operations in northern Ukraine, but nothing more than that. Definitely, they don't have capacity to capture Kiev. And they said that um, they would be deployed to Africa. So we, we again, don't know what their goals there are. There are various speculations uh, that they're involved in um, and various criminal activities and so on. Um, but the Kremlin, I think, can use Wagner in the future, although uh, not in a way it did before, because their Putin's positions are now extremely weak. Although it's the Kremlin's propaganda is trying to create an illusion that the situation in Russia is under control, I don't think it is. Uh, the authorities are now uh, trying to suppress anti uh, Shoigu and anti Gerasimov voices. Um, not anti-Putin voices because none of those critics, none of them dares to openly criticize Putin. They just criticize those two military figures, but not Putin because there there is a um, in, in Russia it's quite common that they criticize uh, all those so-called boyars, but not Tsar himself. So Putin is often portrayed as a good Tsar who apparently doesn't know what's going on, what his bad boyars are doing. Um, of course, he does know what's what's going on, but I think it, it's still not the right time for them to to criticize him. Although in the future they will have to do that because even even the, even someone who does not understand politics and all will see that something's something's rotten in the state of Russia, uh, and that the Kremlin cannot control the situation there. Um, so Wagner forces um, th they were involved in that battle for Bakhmut, which from strategic perspective was completely was was a waste of time and uh, human lives because they they managed to, to capture that town uh, but at what cost they they lost um, thousands if not if not more uh, of lives um, to capture the town that has no strategic importance whatsoever um, maybe they will continue implementing that strategy in northern ukraine or somewhere else where where they will be deployed but we don't know that yet they announced their big return first they said that would be in august but then they said sometime but they didn't they didn't say when exactly um but i i don't think this is the end of um of the wagner group and this is not the end of um rebellions in Russia, there will be more rebellions. If not, Wagner, then a regular Russian army will eventually try to um, punish uh, Shoigu, Gerasimov, Putin, whoever, for for the way that they um, conduct this so-called special military operation, even though this is a full-scale war, but they, for some reason, they refuse to call it that way for political reasons of course uh so yeah this is um i think this is the beginning of um beginning of the end of the era of putin stability so in the future we will see more events like that in russia yeah and, and kind of what you're saying i i kind of uh, as a former teacher dealing with you know high school students university students and having lived in the former soviet union having been to russia you, you sort of get a sense of the the, the feeling of the the power structure there and my, myself having uh come up uh against uh, in in minor ways the the you know kazakh uh the government um you know it's it's like a teacher who loses control uh of his students uh and there's no way to punish i've been in situ situations in different countries in, in, in that situation where there was no way you know with the force of the institution there was nothing i could do to punish uh the student they knew it uh, i knew it and then it's like you, you, now you're playing this delicate, delicate game of trying to save uh, face, and then uh, can, you know c c continue projecting your power. You're you're fighting to 
to not lose your projection of of power and that's how i feel like what what you just described with with putin and and you're like um you know uh prigozhin's the <laughs> one of the students and now uh just as you mentioned you know putin um he's in a delicate situation here so i kind of feel like th there's that dynamic there just real quick on uh before we, we move on do you think there's any possibility i i find this less possible but that the west nato cia mi6 somehow have penetrated uh you know wagner or gotten to prigozhin and then to, to use him to attempt to regime change because you know that theory has been floated uh but and, and do you think that's possible i don't think that would make sense because from the western perspective uh the ideal case scenario would be put in continue pulling the strings in russia as long as possible because if you have such an incompetent leader then it's, it's good for you i mean if you have that kind of opponent so i think from the western perspective it, it, it would be great if putin could just uh, continue um ruling russia although it's rather questionable if he's the one who's ruling there are various oligarchy groups there who are very influential but he is just trying to balance the interests of all those oligarchy groups um but generally i think the west th that's at least what i would do if i were a policymaker in the west i would try to make sure that putin stays in power as long as possible so i wouldn't uh, try to force a regime change there uh, at least until the end of the war after that th that could be possible um, although it is rather questionable if Putin will politically survive this war because if Russia suffers um, large-scale defeats in in Ukraine then um, that could have an impact on, on his um, position and as I said there could be some um, rebellions and the army could launch another march in moscow so not in the wagner group but the regular russian army um and it it will be interesting in any case to see uh, how all this will develop uh but generally no i don't think uh, the west was involved this time i think it was um, just an, an inside job in, in russia an inside job let's jump to lukashenko in belarus exclusive from the uk mi6 telegraph quote thousands of ukrainian children have been forcibly deported to belarus in an alleged alleged war crime that could implicate president alexander lukashenko evidence linking these crimes to lukashenko and other belarusian officials has been submitted to the international criminal court icc now again uh i'm making a cold calculated sort of objective observation i don't have any skin in the game uh you know per se when it comes to lukashenko put in the west east my reaction is this th that this is uh this is uh, just a, a, a hoax based on past history because th the west is lying uh and and we saw you know the the classic textbook case operation desert storm you know when, when the uh, the west wanted to invade iraq the first time and go after Saddam uh, they didn't have enough citizens you know buying into this idea and so they, they needed to drum up uh more public opinion to support the Iraqi invasion so what did they do they uh, hired a Hollywood acting uh agency company uh Hill and Knowlton I can't remember and which trained the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter and people can go watch the videos she's like fake crying in a courtroom testifying that she saw uh, uh Iraqi soldiers killing babies you know throwing them out of incubators in hospitals in Iraq and that was to pull on the heartstrings you know you, you know one, one red flag is when they're talking about oh the babies the children uh, that's to drum up the public opinion for in more war that turned out to be a complete lie and fraud but it worked because it increased the public opinion uh American public opinion for war with Iraq and I feel like that's the same thing that's happening now they're inventing this children uh being trafficked abducted by Belarus and and and, and Russia and Lukashenko to drum up more war against Belarus and and Russia and then take him to the ICC it's the classic you know Milosevic Saddam Hussein um you know Gaddafi Lukashenko ICC and you know on top of that I got contacted by Vice I call it CIA CIA Vice if you're listening yeah sorry I didn't respond to your email because I'm not going to participate in this Vice wanted actually me to have someone on the podcast to talk about this a couple weeks ago so you can see uh it's almost like they, they were building this up so uh this the, this story up you know the, the the past few weeks and so uh that's my take it's it's not you know looking at 
Lukashenko good or bad in this instance. I think this is a false allegations against against Lukashenko. Uh, the same reason one of my professors in Geneva, uh, Dutch American lawyer Curtis Dobler, he was Saddam, he was on Saddam Hussein's defense council. Not because necessarily Saddam's a good guy, but because the weapons of mass destruction allegations were false under under international law. Those Western allegations against Saddam were completely false that he was involved with 9/11 WMDs. So that was false. And so, um, just do you have any thought on these uh, allegations against Lukashenko? And then beyond uh, that, what's going on with uh, Belarus and Lukashenko? Yeah, I don't think it's still official, is it? Um, I mean, they, they've just submitted, you know, that they're making these allegations now. Yeah, but uh, in, in the past, well, actually, it was just a few months ago or so, they did the same thing to, to Putin. So they accused him of uh, trafficking Ukrainian children. Um, I think it's a message to Lukashenko. So from what I understand, it's still not official decision. So uh for now, it could be just a threat or a message. So if you maybe, maybe that's what they, maybe, maybe that's the message. So if you, um, allow Wagner troops to invade Ukraine from the north, or if you do something that you shouldn't, then you could just join, uh, Putin in the Hague, uh, at the ICC. I'm not saying that's, that's, uh, the plan, but it could be, uh, just a threat and message to Lukashenko. We will see how he will react now. Uh, but he is already demonized in the West and nobody there likes him. Um, well, even large segments of the, of the Belarusian population don't like him. Um, and um, I think we spoke about that um, earlier, um, maybe a year ago or so. Uh, I think Lukashenko will simply have to share Putin's faith. So if if Putin eventually gets overthrown, or if he loses power, then that's the end of Lukashenko and the end of Belarus, as we know, because Belarus under Lukashenko is heavily dependent on the Kremlin. Um, and uh, for now, you probably notice that the West did not pressure Lukashenko that much, and Lukashenko was not seriously punished for allowing Ukraine to for allowing uh, Russia to use Belarusian territory for the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so they still tolerate his moves, but if he crosses certain red lines that they created, then he could be punished. But again, I think sooner or later he will have to join Putin in the league or uh, be overthrown, whatever, because without Putin in, in the Kremlin or without um, the oligarchs who pull the strings there, Lukashenko is just... Um, he cannot survive because Belarus economically is too dependent on Russia. And if Russia collapses, then that would be the collapse, not of Belarus, but collapse of Lukashenko and his government. Yeah, and, and maybe to take it back then to the collective uh, West and, and, and NATO and Zelensky, there was a recent summit in, in Vilnius. Um, it just seems like more of the same, nothing ground uh, breaking. Uh, I think Biden administration sending another one plus billion again to uh, Ukraine. Just any any thoughts on NATO, you know, Zelensky's status, and if you feel the collective West is going to, I mean, they're going to keep this going for as long as they can. Do you think they're going to try to ramp something up to expand the war? There's many ways it can be expanded, you know, territorially into into like Poland. Uh, you know, even the West might want to. They might have different projects going on where they might want to break up, balkanize, you know, Poland, you know, even other besides Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, other agendas could be going on. But, you know, any other thoughts uh, on, on on NATO, Vilnius and so forth? OK, so first, I think the war will never spill over into Poland because Poland is an ace member. It would be too dangerous. And I don't think Russia would dare to attack Poland. Uh, it could spill over into Belarus and Moldova. Uh, and regarding NATO summit in Vilnius, uh, it was quite obvious that NATO never really uh, intended to allow Ukraine to join the US dominated alliance. Uh, and Zelensky is also quite aware of that. And he criticized uh, their decision. Um, he said that, that they basically humiliated Ukraine. But unlike Putin, who constantly um, 
accuses his Western partners of deceiving him. Uh, Zelensky did not say something like that. He was he was obviously not satisfied, but he he shows some dignity, unlike Putin, who, who does not show any dignity. He just loves to to cry and complain how he was deceived all the time. And if he's really that naive, I mean, what kind of leader is that? So I understand that um, many people don't like Zelensky, but he, in my opinion, proved to be a more serious leader than Putin. Um, and regarding Ukraine, I don't think it will join NATO anytime soon, if at all. It is quite questionable if it will join the EU. Um, the West obviously has some other plans with Ukraine, and uh, Zelensky's former advisor, Alexei Aristovich, once said that Ukraine it will become a new Israel. And I think that's exactly what's going on in front of our eyes. Um, Ukraine continues receiving all kinds of NATO-made weapons. And uh, now it can strike Russian territory, it can strike Moscow, not only Crimea, but cities that are um, inside of the Russian Federation, even the Russian capital. And Ukraine will continue doing that because it can, because it knows that Russia is not in a position to uh, seriously respond. And NATO, as you said, will just continue arming Ukraine as long as it takes. I can perfectly understand that, um, especially the American military industrial complex is interested that this war um, lasts as long as possible. Uh, I don't understand why uh, the Kremlin is interested in such an outcome. Uh, because if you invade a certain country, your goal should be just to, to do that quickly and to capture it as soon as possible. Not, not, you don't want that war to, to last for a long time because wars are expensive. You have to waste a lot of money on that. Um, and uh, of course, there will be analysts who will claim that this is all part of Russia's cunning plan, that um, Putin was aware of that, but he wants to do, I don't know what he, he is. He just loves fighting long wars or whatever. It's, it sounds ridiculous. Um, so from the Western perspective, um, what's happening is, um, is exactly what should happen because Russia is bleeding, uh, and it's wasting money. And if, um, the energy prices go down, especially oil price, then Russia will be in a, in a big problem because it's also dependent on uh, the energy exports. Uh, so that's what happened to the Soviet Union following the invasion of Afghanistan. And uh, I think um, the collapse of the Soviet Union was not a result of that war. It was the result of uh, low energy prices. Um, and uh, the war had an impact on, on the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but energy prices had also a, a big impact. Uh, and uh, that's what we can expect when it comes to the Russian Federation. So if energy prices go down, uh, Russia will be in a big problem. Um, it, does export grains and some other stuff, but it is still its economy is still um, heavily dependent on energy exports. And those companies that I mentioned, Gazprom and uh, some others, Lukoil, uh, Zarubezhnev, and so on, um, they basically um, want to continue exporting uh, gas and uh, oil, if not to the West, then to to Asia. But the problem is that uh, Asian market cannot replace the European market, which was. The major market for uh russian energy business uh and um yeah now i switched to energy and you asked me about nato um so yeah as, as i said ukraine will not join nato but nato will continue supporting ukraine and it's entirely possible that eventually nato troops will uh enter ukraine um maybe polish troops that you mentioned and then russia will have a very big problem. It will be a test, another test for Russia. If it um, conducts air strikes or missile strikes on Polish troops, then it will be a de facto war. Um, if not, if it turns a blind eye, it will be another humiliation for the Kremlin. It's the same when it comes to Turkey. If Turkey decides to uh, send its navy to the Black Sea to help Ukraine export its grains, then Russia will have to either to to hit those ships or to turn a blind eye. And I think knowing the Kremlin's modus operandi, I think Russia will simply turn a blind eye. Uh, but I'm not saying that that's exactly what's going to happen. I think Turkey decided not to do that at this point. Although in the future, um, some kind of confrontation between Russia and Turkey is entirely possible, but not between Russia and Poland, because I think um, 
Poland, uh, although both countries are NATO members, but uh, I don't think Poland uh, aims to capture any Russian territories except maybe in Kaliningrad. Um, although it's, I think uh, that that's not on the agenda at this point. But um, Crimea is much more important at this stage of the conflict. And um, in a post-war Ukraine, if Ukraine manages to recapture Crimea, Turkey will play a very important role there because it has strong ties with the Crimean Tatars, um, who will also play an important role after the war. Throughout history, empires have risen and fallen. Some of the most successful empires were those that offered people a reason to come, often lower taxes and the prospect of citizenship. In ancient times, empires would say foreigners can become one of us and prosper through business and trade. Throughout history, people have gravitated to jurisdictions that have given them the best conditions to do business. So if you run a business, you should consider nomad capitalists because they help entrepreneurs and investors relocate to parts of the world where they can keep more of their wealth. They literally wrote the book on it, The Best-Selling Nomad Capitalist. Find it on Amazon. If you're an entrepreneur or investor and believe you're paying too much in tax, or if you'd like to get a second passport or a third passport like I have to expand your options and not have to be relying on one government, there are legal ways to do this. Nomad Capitalist has been assisting over a 1,000 clients for the last 10 years. You can check out their 2,000 plus educational YouTube videos and nearly 2,000 blogs. Just go to nomadcapitalist.com, learn how they can help you legally reduce your tax bill, expand your options globally, and navigate the algorithm ghetto. Let's set the record uh, straight, Nicola, for people who have been commenting for uh, a year uh, on whether you are a, uh, what's it called, Drugo. Serbianats, uh, you know, my view, my, my reading of you from the beginning is I feel like you're, you're not, you know, necessarily like pro Western, anti Russian. I think you're just looking at the reality of the situation. You're maybe more cynical, which is more common for us in the Balkans. I share a lot of your perspective as well. And then you're, you're looking at Putin and the Kremlin and you're like, you're not like anti Putin or Russian. You're like, what the heck are you guys doing? Like you guys are incompetent. Like you, you know. And there are these people out there that are just like cheerleaders. That you know, even the alternative, the the anti imperialist, anti Western imperialist imperialist camp fall into this clownish, cartoonish, us versus them world, which doesn't exist in reality. There's this nuance, and I view more. Uh, you know, it's like bad guys versus bad guys. There, there are really no good guys, and there are people. Who have this need to have, to have this hero to cling to somebody? Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's no heroes. But if you want to set the record straight, I mean, what's your view? You know, are you pro Western, anti Western, pro Russian, or, or I mean, I, I, am I correct that you're not like anti uh, Russian in that sense? No, well, you could say I'm pro Serbian, but when it comes to Russia and the West, I don't have any reasons to support neither Russian nor the West. Even if Russia wins this war, which I don't think will happen, nothing will change in my life because my country will remain surrounded by NATO and EU countries. Uh, and if Russia does not win, again, nothing will change here. So um, for me, it's completely relevant. Whoever wins, nothing will change in my life. I'm just analyzing this war uh, for my own reasons because I'm interested in what's going on there. I have some personal ties with both Ukraine and Russia, and uh, I may explain that. Um, in the near future um but generally i don't support any sides in this conflict i'm just trying to be an unbiased analyst now i understand that there are people who who don't like that they just want propaganda but i'm sorry i'm not a propagandist i i don't want to be anyone with propagandist uh, i i prefer to focus on facts so uh most of my predictions came true uh i was wrong on, on some things for instance I, I did not expect russia to retaliate when ukraine hit the crimean bridge in October last year. But generally, I think that most of my predictions were true and correct. Um, because uh, I'm not talking about what I want to happen, but what's realistic. And if you see that Russia is, uh, it, it, that Russia continues demonstrating weakness, and that it's doing that all the time, then why do you expect that it will do something different uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? It, it's impossible as long as people like Putin and um, Roman Abramovich, uh, Sergei Lavrov, um, Rottenberg, and all the others are pulling the strings in Kremlin. There will be no changes. They're not there to uh, to change the situation, but um, 
your guests yesterday perfectly pointed that out so uh, they want to preserve status quo um that's their major task and if you noticed um after the collapse of the soviet union there were some conflicts um for instance in uh, transnistria or um, georgia um south ossetia and uh, they were not resolved they're still frozen conflicts so the Kremlin never resolved any of those conflicts. It, it, it just seems to enjoy freezing conflicts. And that's exactly what it's trying to do now, to freeze the Ukraine conflict. But that's not going to happen because the West wants this uh, war to go on. Maybe eventually they will uh, force both Ukraine and Russia to sign some kind of a ceasefire agreement, which could be uh, described as a Minsk II agreement. Oh, no, we have Minsk II already, Minsk III or Istanbul too, or whatever. Um, but it will be just a ceasefire. It will not hold. It will be just like the Minsk one and Minsk two agreements because um, I already spoke about that. So the, the, the very nature of this conflict suggests that it, it has to be decided on the battlefield and that one of the two parties involved simply has to de facto capitulate. Um, or the West could just, for whatever reason, decide to uh stop supporting ukraine and allow russia to save face to maybe to preserve crimea or donbass or something else um but again i don't know what western plans about uh russia are so that's why i cannot go that, that far um and um again i don't support any sides in this conflict and, and maybe that's the reason why most of my predictions came true because uh i just uh, try to be realistic and to focus on facts rather than on my expectations or wishes i don't have any wishes i would i, would, I have a sympathy for um a sentiment for both ukrainian and russian people but not for um oligarchs that run both those countries although in ukraine uh now it is the west that has a larger influence than oligarchs and, and the pre-war ukraine oligarchs were equally powerful as in as they are in russia but not anymore so i think that will change after the war uh, we will see more western influence and less influence um inside of the ukrainian oligarchs uh but generally both nations are victims of what's what's happening both peoples and uh there will be no winner when it comes to uh to just ordinary people um but i think uh the major winner of this war will be the united states it already is because as we said it is exporting weapons and its uh, military industrial conflict is, is working 24 7. um so it's definitely benefiting from what's going on and if i were a policymaker in the west i would do exactly the same because that's what politics is it's there's nothing moral about politics that's, that's just how things work so yeah and i i i would agree with you i think that that's my uh position as again yuri roshka my recent guest pointed out that you know he he also uh, was referring to me that but the, I, I would agree of his assessment of myself that i'm not aligned to any center of power uh whether it's pro west or pro collective kremlin or pro collective uh you know ccp or beijing uh you know i'm anti my my principles are anti imperialist anti you know globalist anti authoritarianism which includes the Chinese uh, model or technocracy. And so those are my principles. And I, I don't see anyone espousing them. Th that's the problem. And then that's why I see comments like yesterday. Someone says, oh, I'm pro multipolarity or I'm cr quit criticizing it now. Yes, I'm here. I'm observing it. And I'm kind of like Yuri Roshka, who's, you know, who said, uh, you know, maybe if multipolarity were done right or if there was teeth to it, uh, it it could be a good idea to take down Western globalism, but now the more you look into it, like there's this geo uh, Spanish geopolitical thinker called Miguel Yenas who lives out in the Middle East. I follow him on Twitter. He just made an uh, amazing analysis on Twitter. I agree with him. He says, like, look, the whole BRICS multipolar project is a Western globalist project. There are people who just want to ignore that. I'm like, no, you know, they they want to live in this some sort of dream. It was it was concocted by the World Economic Forum. Gold, Goldman Sachs bankers uh and 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 so forth so I, I don't see this as saving us it's like we're in between a rock and a hard place that's the stone cold truth and I'm not gonna you know invent some reality that doesn't 
exists. So if people want to see it, uh, see it. If not, you know, take it or leave it for people that complain about what I'm doing. I, I, I really don't care. But anyways, uh, that, that brings us then to the million dollar question, Nicola. What is really what is really going on? How do you explain explain uh, you know this multipolarity? You've been talking about uh, this with Roloslavsky and Riley Wagaman and and people like this, and I think that that's getting to the real heart of the matter. Uh, you know this contradiction of there is this struggle on the surface between West and East, but then we see the collective Kremlin and the collective CCP and 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 the collective uh, West working together on globalism, implementing technocracy, Agenda 21, uh, giving all the power to the WHO and stuff. Uh, and, and any thoughts on, on, on this and what's really going on? Um, frankly, I don't know who those globalists are because um, there are apparently some globalists and their opponents are who are some sovereignists. But if you look at the United States, for instance, it is a country that it's a very sovereign country, right? Possibly a um, country that has um, a lot of sovereignty compared to, to all the other nations in this world. But then it is it is also, a, as you would say, pro-globalist country. So those globalists are also sovereignists at the same time when it comes to the United States, right? Um, but generally, we live in the world that is dominated by the United States and the Western civilization. You can like it or dislike it, but that's, that's just a fact. Um, and um, even those Russian leaders and Chinese leaders, they just uh, follow the rules that were um, created by the West. Um, I don't, I don't simply see that uh, multipolar world. I don't understand why would the United States that dominates this world, why would it allow Russia and China to um, to create that multipolar world? It, it's just not realistic. Um, and I understand that there are people who would like multipolar world to, to exist but uh and and then they create an illusion that uh, russia is working on a so-called de-dollarization and something even though putin openly said that that's not what russia is doing russia is he said russia is not interested in any form of de-dollarization be it in the russian federation or globally so russia is still part of, of the western dominated economic system and all other systems um and um if it cannot defeat Ukraine, then why would anyone think that uh, Russia could um, create some kind of a multipolar world? It's not realistic. Um, China is a significant regional power, but I don't think it has capacity to rule the world. Um, at this point, it is the West that, that, that has capacity to do that, although I don't think that will last for for forever. I mean, it was for 200, 300 years more, and then there will be someone else who will replace the West as the major uh, power. Um, nothing lasts forever. But at this point, we're living in a world that is dominated by uh, the United States and its European allies, basically the Western civilization. Uh, so I wrote an article on multipolar world for uh, geopolitics and empire and uh, how Russia and China uh, started um spreading that narrative it was about 20 years ago basically ever since Putin came to power so to this day they continue building that multipolar world but it's it's just nowhere to be seen uh all i see around myself is the west i see um the western made financial system i see um well even the, those computers that we use and this internet it was created in the west yeah maybe it was manufactured in china but it's it's a product of the Western civilization. So whoever wants to um, rule the world or to, or to eliminate the existing world order needs to, to have an alternative. So needs to have a clear idea of how, how he wants this world to, to look. Um, and you, have, you need to have a total picture of, of the world, um, which I don't think anyone has. Maybe, uh, maybe ISIS or that kind of organizations could represent an alternative, although I don't think they have capacity to, to rule the world. But generally, all the others, it's more or less the same version of what we already have. So Russia and China and uh, all other countries that are in the BRICS, they just want to improve their own positions within the existing world order, not to create something different. Um, and I'm not surprised that that's the situation because they're not capable of doing that. All those um, civilizations, uh, Chinese and 
um, even Indian, and uh, they're they're quite old. They they don't have capacity to do that. So there would need to be um, fresh blood to replace uh, the old and tired Western civilization. But that's not on the horizon yet. In the future, that could happen, but not right now. So we will continue living in in this world, and there will be more uh, technocracy. Uh, there will be more uh, digital uh, stuff like digital currency and so on. It's it's inevitable. We can like it or dislike it, but that's that's what will happen um, because there's no alternative to that. Um, I mean, you could say I don't like it. I I don't want that. I want to preserve status quo, but it just doesn't work. You need to to have um, another concept. You need to provide an alternative, which is what nobody has. So we just go with the flow and uh, that's that's what we will have. So we will we will live in a world that, that will be dominated by the West for a long time, but definitely until until the end of our lives. And possibly, as I said, for the next 200, 300 years, the West will continue dominating this planet. Yeah, just to add, when you referenced ISIS, I don't think you meant you wanted ISIS to win. I think you just meant that they had and they they had they have a model uh ready to they go. do have a model yeah uh, yeah, yeah like, they do uh, they have all well, they have clear ideology they have a model um there are people who believe that they were also created by the cia oh, or right whatever. Yeah. i don't know yeah maybe they were maybe not but they do have an ideology and um but no nobody else i don't see any other organizations that could offer anything different to to what we already have so that was yeah, my and, point. And, and, i think you nailed it as, as well others have said this i think uh that what the collective Kremlin and, and the multipolar world is actually doing. They're looking for a better seat at the table of global governance. We're in world government now. I just got a YouTube strike by the world government, by Pentagon tube. Uh, and it says, because the WHO, the world government, I, uh, you know, I criticized the world government, WHO, United Nations, world government. Uh, they, they shut my mouth. They gave me a slap uh, on the face, so to, so to speak. So yeah, we're already in it. Uh, we're we're, in, we're living in this global governance structure: United Nations, Bretton Woods system, IMF, World Bank, and so I think just as you say, uh, you know, Russia, China, everyone else, they're trying to um, they're you know second tier, uh, and so they're trying to fight for a better better seat at the table. And yeah, you were in Kazakhstan recently. You, you wrote a great article for me about how the technocracy is really advancing in Kazakhstan. Just any quick thoughts on you know the advance of the cashless system in Kazakhstan. It was a great experience in Kazakhstan. It's a country where you literally cannot do anything unless you have uh, a mobile phone or all those apps. Um, yeah, it's a highly digitalized society. And uh, th that's what uh, people in China already experience on a daily basis. I did not expect to see that in Kazakhstan, uh, but it's there, obviously. And uh, us speaking with people there, um, I think they they don't mind it. They like it. Um, in Europe, people don't like it generally, and maybe in the United States to a certain extent, because especially here in Europe, we have a um, well, fairly old population, and uh, old people are generally conservative, and they don't like changes. So I, I don't think it will be that easy to implement such a model in Europe. Um, I mean, it will be implemented, but n not not that quickly as, as Kazakhstan managed to do that, because um, I think the median age in Kazakhstan is like 30 or so and the uh, young people generally accept um digital currencies and stuff like that in, in Europe it's not going to work like that it will take some time for people to adapt to that uh but that's what we will have in Europe and in Mexico as well in the United States uh, as I said I think it's inevitable um and um but generally uh, when it comes to to politics uh, about Kazakhstan if you want yeah uh, the country is just uh, trying to balance between uh, Russia and um, not the West, but between Russia and China. So that's why it's taking a pro-Western political course, because it sees uh, the West as some kind of salvation, because it, it has um, Russia in the North and then China, two giant neighbors, and it sees the West as some kind of alternative. Although the problem for Kazakhstan is that the West is too far and it cannot, um, it cannot help uh, Kazakhstan in case of any hostilities or maybe it can we will see it's it's not improbable that the war will eventually come to Kazakhstan although I hope it will not have it it won't happen in, at all but we should not rule that out we live in quite turbulent times um but 
Turkey is also uh, increasing its presence there, especially when it comes to military cooperation. Um, I think I wrote about that recently. So Turkey is um, actually Kazakhstan is purchasing some Turkish um, infantry vehicles, I believe, uh, which is quite interesting because Kazakhstan is it's a nominal Russian ally. It's a member of the Russian led um, collective security treaty organization, CSTO. Um, and uh, it's developing close military cooperation with a NATO member Turkey and the Kremlin is fine with that. It continues turning a, a blind eye to such actions because uh, Russia remains bogged down in Ukraine and can do basically nothing to prevent Kazakhstan from doing that. And Kazakhstan is just using um, the opportunity to distance itself from Russia, which from their perspective makes sense because they want to uh, pursue, well, more or less independence policy. Although, as I said, there are very few uh, independent and sovereign countries in the world. I think the United States is one of them, maybe the Great Britain, but um, there are very few sovereign countries in this world. Um, and some of them are trying to to play the role of a uh, new uh, Yugoslavia under Tito, as, as you remember. Um, maybe that's what uh, Tokayev in Kazakhstan is trying to do, just to, uh, to balance between um, Russia and China and the West. So far, he, he's, he's doing that relatively successfully, but we'll see what the future will bring. We got some cowboys that don't want to play along with the globalist single center of power. As you said, I think when you mentioned the US, Washington or London as being sovereign, because they are closer to the single center of power, which means they can, they have more freedom to do what they want and be sovereign than, than the uh, rest. And you heard it from Nicola, the algorithm ghetto, it's coming, it's advancing the mark of the beast uh, system. So so uh, prepare. I'll include uh, your links, Nicola, in the description. You're on Twitter. You've got a Telegram channel. Uh, your articles go up uh, on, on Muckrack and, and, and so forth. Uh, are those the best places to find you? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Uh, and uh, if they read Geopolitics and Empire, they can find my articles. <laughs> Um, and yeah, they can visit my Mockrock page, which which is where they will find most of my articles published by various publications all over the world. All right. It was good to have you uh, again on Geopolitics and Empire. Thank you, Harwin. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes, Facebook restricts our page, Reddit and Twitter take down posts, and after the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.